Welcome and welcome back to the hot seat. I'm your host, Greg Cardone. It's a beautiful day for an interview. Won't you be my guest? And speaking of guests, today we have H. Melvin James, author extraordinaire. And we'll be talking about his novels, Tears Among the Wheat, volumes one and two, and a new novel that is about to be released, Death in Tomorrow's Shadow. That seems interesting. Pretty neat title. So stay with us. I'm sure you'll want to hear about it. And we'll be right back. Today's guest, H. Melvin James, again, author of classic literary fiction from rural Oklahoma. Melvin, thanks for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Greg. I appreciate this. Oh, this is great. I've been really looking forward to this interview, reading your books, and now hearing the whole backstory behind it. Let me ask you. What inspired you to write these books? Uh, I uh, began my career as an engineer in college. Before that, in high school, I had a high school teacher who uh, uh, thought I should look into writing. But I went on to college as an engineer, went through engineering and came back to college for a second degree in business. And business required me to have an elective in some humanity. So I took English literature. And the professor there thought I should be in writing, but I was already dedicated to a career in engineering. And uh, as a consequence, I served my career throughout aerospace and defense industries. And when I retired, only then did I have the peace of mind and the time and all of that to really consider writing as an author. And so my first novel is a classic American novel. Uh, it's an epic novel of two volumes, and I dedicated, acknowledged both my high school and college professors of literature uh, in the acknowledgement section of that novel. But uh, what inspired me was I think my mother was always into literature. She told stories as I was a child growing up, and she told stories about her parents and people of the old times back in the early part of the 20th century. So her storytelling, I suppose, uh, gave me inspiration to, to write, to describe things and events. I know you had to drive quite a bit so we can get, <laughs> so we can get you on air. I, I live on the farm where I grew up, uh, and that was where my inspiration came from. But uh, I moved uh, there when I retired about 20 years ago and designed and built my own house on that farm. It's a high energy efficient house uh, that I designed virtually every nail and board in that house down to a very little detail. And uh, there it's a peaceful place to write. I built the house on the edge of a forest overlooking a meadow and I can set in my den in my big easy chair and write with my laptop on, on my lap. And uh, I can go back to, to my childhood and the stories I heard. And that is where I gained inspiration for my first novel, entirely from my parents and my grandparents. My second novel, inspiration came from my service in the military and in my career working uh, classified military Department of Defense contracts. Well, well, thank you for your service. We appreciate that. And thank you to all our service members out there. We appreciate that. It sounds like a great place where you're at right now to be able to just be in, in a peaceful area. You know, like, is that like, you know, Walden Lake where, you know, the, you, you read his books and overlooking. I would, I'd like to do that kind of hard right now. 
didn't win the lottery. Tell us the meaning of tears, T-A-R-E-S. I had no idea about that until I looked at the book. I okay. looked it up, but tell our viewers out there, what is it? What does it mean? Several uh, readers have told me that uh, they had to look up tares. It comes from uh, from the New Testament, Matthew thirteen twenty five, and in that in that passage, uh, Christ is talking about the difference between the people that are are, are not going to be uh, good souls, the ones that uh, are uh, sinful and and cause havoc to the other people. And it's a it's a parody. It's a uh, analogy of weeds growing in the wheat. Tares are, is an ancient name for weeds. So he's talking about how to keep the tares separated from the wheat. And in the end, it's it's said that the tares will not be separated until after the harvest, because to uproot the tares would destroy the wheat. As you pulled up the weeds, it would uproot the, the wheat stalks. So consequently, tares among the wheat is, is a, it, it alludes to people that are not good at heart, mixed in and interfering with the lives of people that are good. But those people are a necessary part of society and they, they can't be separated uh, until the end. So the idea is that some Characters in my novel relate to the tares. Others relate to the wheat that are good, basic people. The novel is not a religious novel, however, even though I borrowed the title from the New Testament. Uh, the novel, I like to think of it as being about life. And there's murder involved in the novel. There's disappearance of people. There's theft. And every facet of life that we ordinarily see, and that includes religion. There's also mysticism in the novel. Uh, there are stories of, about old uh, superstitions, curses. Uh, my uh, grandparents came from old Europe, some of them uh, more recent to America than others, but they came here with their own superstitions and their own cultures that were in a lot of ways contrasted with each other. One grandparent was from Ireland, her family was, another one was from Czech Republic. Uh, one grandparent was from Germany and another one from uh, the Netherlands. So consequently those four grandparents, although they each came from a different culture, they married and they had their interesting clashes and discussions and stories to tell. And that was probably my biggest inspiration there. That's pretty interesting. Kind of sounds like my grandparents coming from four different areas in Europe. How they met, no idea, but I'm a little of everything. And I'm sure everybody else, <laughs> they're a little of everything also. That sounds amazing that even from the historical value, you know, those same things are going on now. So it's not, you know, what happened hundreds of years ago is still going on now. So it's not any different. The second novel, volume two, tell us a little bit about that also. How, did, how does that continue from the first volume? The first volume is setting up a lot of the storylines, a lot of the frame stories. This is a complex epic sort of novel. It covers the period from 1890 to 1970. And within that period, it's following the lineage of an Irish family from New York City, originally from Ireland, of course. And there's some discussion about their history in Ireland before they come to America. But they arrive in America after the Civil War. And from there, they migrate to Kentucky, then Tennessee, Louisiana, and finally to Oklahoma, where the land run of 1893, uh, which was the largest land run in the history of the world, 
where some 120,000 people all began with a cannon blast uh, to race across the prairies and stake their claim to 160 acres of land. And uh, all four of my grandparents were in that land run. So the first volume sets this up and gets to the point of where they, this lineage of Irish that mixes with Germans uh, settles on the, on the prairie about 1893. And it ends with a lot of unanswered questions about uh, what is going to become of the, uh, of the family. Uh, there's a, a number of mysteries that are involved in the second volume. There are two murders. There's disappearance of, of, a, of a young woman. There's also the disappearance of a young lad who runs away from home. All of those open-ended sort of adventures come to conclusion in the second volume. And it's, it's the extension of all the stories began in the first volume, as well as uh, uh, the coming to the conclusion of the main character in the volume, who is uh, Amelia, uh, who carries the, the story through from beginning to end. And Amelia then, her storyline is broken up into histories of her family lineage going back to uh, the 1800s and uh, one up through 1970, which is her own time frame. In a discussion that we had, you said that the volumes or the, the story had to be split into two. So that's why there's two volumes. Yes. It, and <laughs> tell us a little of uh, the backstory on why it had to be split into two volumes. Uh, I, I, I just began writing the novel, and the novel seemed to carry itself. Uh, the background I got from my grandparents helped me develop the characters, knowing of their own immigration to America and how they ended up, all four of them, in the land run in Oklahoma, despite coming from various areas. So I kept writing the novel and developing the characters and developing the storyline and I had already set out for the novel to take place with the main frame of the story occurring in one year of 1970. So people of this later generation could relate to that. But in that 1970 year time frame, the main character suffers a concussion and is uh, invalid for nine months of that year. And during her being in a coma, she can hear and think, but she can't move or, or communicate very well. She's visited by an old elderly lady who tells her stories of the past. And therein comes all the frame stories uh, of, of her past relatives. Then as I grew this novel, it became more and more in length, but I opened and created scenarios and stories that could not come to a conclusion just in a few hundred pages. Consequently, the, the novel, by the time I derived and concluded all the storylines, was over 1,250 pages. So I took it to my publisher, and they said, this has got to be uh, reduced. So I worked, worked and worked to reduce it. I cut out 10, 20, 30 pages. It was still... 1,250 pages, and I couldn't cut anymore without cutting into the storyline. So they said, okay, well, we've got to split it into two books, uh, and you tell us where to split it. And I worked, again, very much difficulty in trying to find a place somewhere near the center of the book to split it, and I did. I, I made a few rearrangements, and, and I found a place where it could logically stop on a cliffhanger with a lot of the story concluded, but a lot of the story left remaining open. And that's why it's two volumes. Uh, altogether, it's longer uh, in both those volumes than Gone with the Wind. But fortunately, it's shorter than War and Peace. That's... <laughs> that book would have been huge. <laughs> that would have been a tough book. 
<laughs> Here it is. That, There's the two boys. Five. That's amazing. Well, I put together a little clip from some of the photographs that you sent me, and I know you do an extensive amount of traveling. I, I love I do a lot of traveling. I take a lot of pictures. I love to share it with people. And I like to see other people's pictures, you know, living vicariously, you know, through their eyes. And there's nothing wrong with that. I think people yeah. should get out and travel. But I put together a little video piece for you, which I like to do for our guests. It just gives me something to do and, mm -hmm. and portrays something. So let's take a quick look at it. Okay. And when we come back, maybe you can uh, give us a little history of the photos, and then we'll be talking about your new upcoming book and your book signing that's coming. So just okay. stay with us, and we'll come back right after this video clip. Promotional consideration paid for in part by Nuggo's Wonder Nuggets. See Synth Wunderbark. And we're back with H. Melvin James, author of classic literary fiction. And we're talking about his books, Tears Among the Wheat, Volumes 1 and 2. And he does have a new book coming out. Death in Tomorrow Shadows. But we'll be talking about that. What did you think about that little video that I put together for you? Good job, Greg. Uh, you, I think you caught the essence of the novel there in just a few seconds. It's a very dynamic adventure novel, primarily adventure. There is some romance, there's mystery, uh, there's mystique. There's a lot of facets to that novel. Naturally, it is so large, but uh, one of the important turning points in that novel is the little church in the country that you showed in that video clip. There is where a primary character, a main protagonist, meets a, a fate of having an accident and resulting in a concussion. And therein begins the storylines that she dreams or hears about from a, a caretaker while she's in a coma that goes back some 90 years into her own family lineage and creates the frame stories within the novel. That when you sent those, I was like, how am I going to put something like that together and try to follow the story of it? And since I, I, I look at things very, very visually and I went with the shutter, OK, because that had to deal with, you know, you taking photographs and then the glasses on the book on the park bench and you had a little blink and you know somebody taking off their glasses maybe it's you know they have to use it for reading and then maybe it's a little blurry for when they're looking at, at the church and in, in the distance and oh we have a visitor what are you doing here buddy well <laughs> you know what we're just gonna keep going with it everybody <laughs> this is Lewis. <laughs> Lewis, Hello, Lewis. Lewis is a flame point Siamese, cross eyed as all get up with beautiful blue eyes. Yes, I feel like I'm a zookeeper. <laughs> I have a little distraction here four cats, a dog, an African gray parrot, 
and oh. a red-eared slider. So in my spare time, I'm part-time pet store owner. So getting <laughs> back to <laughs> we just keep rolling, folks. It's, we're not live, but we're live recording. But looking at the church and going and then the 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 car that was, you know, in it and, and the page curl. These are just things that the the one thing I I can commend you on is I do have a copy of the book. I actually read books. I do not watch a lot of TV. I really don't. I could sit in here in the house. I'll play music and I don't put the TV on. So, yes, I have a copy of the book and we have some real. Oh, I just lost my page, but I know where I was at. I always end on a chapter. I never end on a page. And so I could start a new chapter and we have some pretty, no, you can't see it, pretty neat bookmarks here. You have the new novel coming out. Death in Tomorrow's Shadow. I found that title to be pretty interesting as everything you do, but getting back to how you put your words and how I was able to visualize as I was reading. So I, I, I wasn't just reading words in there for reading words sakes and trying to understand what you were doing. Your words actually transported me. No, I'm not weird. And you know, I don't, I don't drink. So don't worry about that. <laughs> but it, it actually transported me into what you were trying to convey in it with, you know, the people. Uh, it was amazing. Probably one of the best verbal to visual books I have read in a long time. Because I will read something, I'm like, um, I'm just not feeling it. And as much as I try to go more in depth into some of these books. It's just like, nope, just same thing with a movie. No, first 15 minutes, I'm like, where's this thing going? I had no idea. <laughs> so getting back to Death in Tomorrow's Shadow. How did you come up with that title for this novel? There is one place in the entire world where that title could actually be real. It sounds unreal uh, tomorrow being a place that exists today but on the international date line that runs a line from the north pole to the south pole through the bering strait in alaska on the east side of that line is always today on the west side of that line is always tomorrow that's where the date changes uh, and so that as the sun comes up on the west side of that line, it is the beginning of that new day. And that's where that new day begins. I actually served some time in the military in that rough general location where you could conceivably see a shadow falling across your feet that was a shadow of a mountain on the Kamchatka Peninsula that actually is in tomorrow. So the mountain of tomorrow could cast a shadow into today. And if, as the novel, uh, fictitious novel, relates to someone being killed on a remote island in the Arctic Circle, conceivably that death could occur in the shadow of tomorrow. And that was a, a point of interest uh, for the title, but uh, the, the story uh, is set in the beginning on a remote island that is fictitious, but it's a uh, sensitive listening station for electronic signals from around the world, uh, similar to one where I served. The, the, since uh, I had military service in clandestine electronic surveillance, and I had a career in Department of Defense 
projects and programs, I was required as an author to submit that book since it related to those topics. Uh, I had to submit that book to uh, a federal agency. I won't say which one, but they had to go through that entire book. It took them seven weeks to make certain that I did not accidentally disclose any information that is classified. So that uh, process has been gone through. The book is now at my editors, at my publisher, uh, and it, I couldn't even send it to my editor until the government agency had approved it. So, uh, or even get it copyrighted. So I went through those throws. I think the reader will find the book interesting. It's a murder mystery, a classic murder mystery, first person narrative, and the background, uh, this mysterious island of clandestine electronic surveillance does not carry the story necessarily. I could not get into much detail about operations on such a fictitious island, such a fictitious installation, but it does add interest to the story. And I think uh, those who like classic murder mysteries will find uh, this this book to be interesting and, and just what they're looking for. That sounds amazing. And it reminded me of that movie ice station zebra you know if, i'm not going to talk about the movie but you need to go see it so you get an idea it almost reminded me of the movie the thing when <laughs> oh, i remember that <laughs> that was that, you know so when you kind of give an idea all all of these other movies or books or something it's like, yeah, but everything is written about everything else. Uh, yeah, you know, it. That's why there's you know movies are made. It's like, well, that's very similar to that. Well, but they all tell a different story. You know, it doesn't sound like a copycat story in there. I think that's going to be great. I can't wait till it comes out. Those are my. Those are really my type of books. Not that I. I do not like this book because when I I, I travel. And I go on the plane. I want to read a book. I, I don't want to watch a movie on my phone. And I don't carry a 12-inch tablet or anything like that. And I don't know. I put on my headphones. I have some music. Actually, these headphones. And I'll, I'll read in there. So tell us about some upcoming events that you have planned here. Melvin. Okay, I have a book signing scheduled uh, October 26th, just next week on Thursday at uh, Deer Clan Bookstore in Bethany, Oklahoma. Uh, it's on College Avenue there in Bethany. Bethany is a suburb of Oklahoma City, so people of that vicinity are well aware of uh, Bethany. It's actually part of the huge metroplex that is Oklahoma City in general, greater Oklahoma City. And I'll be there from 6.30 in the evening to 7.30 in the evening. Uh, my book is for sale there, but if you, uh, if you buy my book there or if you have already bought a copy of my novel, you can come by and I'll be pleased to meet you and to autograph your book for you. Well, speaking <laughs> of autograph books... I have my own personal copy signed by H. Melvin James, prize possession. And this was when we first met each other. Let's just say that. And we've been friends for the last few years and been following him. And I was like, here we are. <laughs> you, you, you just never know who you're going to meet. Always say hi to somebody in an elevator, even though we didn't meet in an elevator. We will be posting that information for the book signing. As always, we tell you to like, comment, share, subscribe, review. And this is breaking news and announcement. H. Melvin James became an official sponsor sponsor of the hot seat. Yay. So we are always looking for sponsors and you know, we're, we're here about helping other people promote them. 
I'm not promoting myself. I'm done promoting. But we're here to help you know, authors, writers, fitness, lifestyle people. We have some doctors, musicians, some wrestlers. You name it, we're restaurant owners. I don't, people like, I want to be on your show. And they ask, what do I do? I said, well, I have an internet interview show. I don't really consider this a podcast. Maybe it is, but I think it's more of a show where we're portraying our guests, not talking heads back and forth. I want our viewers to listen to our guests. And if it's something that you find interesting, a little bit of benefit, that's all we want to have other people listen to other people and to get some value out of that, especially with reading books, which seems to, I, I don't know how people read books from their phone or laptop that, you know, to me, I, I, I want to feel the book. I want to curl the pages. I want, you know, it's like business cards. It's all about, you know, the touch, the feel of something like that. It's, you know, it, it's a sensory. So let's use a little bit about our, let's use some of our senses. I, I go off on a tangent here as usual in the show, but that's just, you know, my contribution to it. Well, incidentally, Greg, for those that do prefer to read a book on a laptop or a reader, a Kindle or something like that, my novel is available in all of those formats, Kindle, Apple, and so forth, uh, as well as in print copy. My next book, by the way, uh, Death in Tomorrow's Shadow, will be available in all of those formats as well as an audio book. Oh, that's great. So people could listen to it in the car rather than blasting music. Yes, and that's where some of that you talked about being able to describe things that you could visually imagine being there uh, will be very important for an audio book. Because if you're driving uh, yeah. the car and you're distracted with traffic, you can't have to concentrate hard on what the narrator is saying uh, because you'd lose track of your traffic safety or else you'd lose track of the book, one of the two. So if it's descriptive enough that you can mind your driving as well as get into the book, that would be good. That's why I said. That, I studied for some classes that way. That's yeah. when it was CDs. And uh -huh. I had to listen, you know, 10 hours of CDs for a class I was taking and a certification. I've it, done that. To me, it wasn't distracting because it was kind of subliminal. But it, it, it definitely would not be as distracting as people on their cell phones. It's not a oh, mobile. My goodness. Yeah, yes. Yeah, it's that's not, a proven fact. It's not a mobile phone book. <laughs> yeah. In yeah. there. But I will, and as always, we will post where H. Melvin James books can be bought, where they're distributed at. All that will be in the credits. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart, without bouncing off the microphone here, in becoming one of our sponsors. So please support our sponsors. Go to his website and you'll see wherever his book is available. So remember to like, share, comment, subscribe, tell your friends. If you want to be on the show, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, reviews, you know where to reach us at the hot seat 813 at gmail.com. So again, H. Melvin James, thank you very much. This was this was great, informative, and again, I will thank you for helping us sponsor the hot seat. Yeah, so thank you, me. Greg, for having me. My I really pleasure. appreciate. It. We will have you on again. Good, it was fun. And we'll be talking about uh, tomorrow's shadows when it's available, and and we'll do another segment about that. We we have Good. no problem getting you back on. I look so, forward to that. Thank you. So thank do you. I. So thank you for joining us today. This is the hot seat. I'm your host, Greg Cardone. And as always, it's a beautiful day for an interview. Won't you be my guest? 
Have a great day.